Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 10 of LTEC 676. I want to begin by welcoming you back from spring break. I hope it was a restful, peaceful, fun, spiritual, emotional, physical, and whatever else you needed it to be so that you are coming back recharged and refreshed and ready to tackle the last month and a half of the semester. To get us started, I've put together a new due date feedback form that I would like you to fill out. If you recall, we made some changes to the due dates based on your mid-semester course feedback. A nearly universal idea was to change the due date of the critical reflections to Sunday at 11.55 a.m. instead of Saturday which, of course, would give everyone only 24 hours to do their peer responses. So far, we've tried this once, and hopefully you liked it. So please let me know via this form if we should stick with the new due dates. Please complete this form by Thursday at 5 p.m. so I can make changes if needed. Of course, Critical Reflection 6 was all about applying the ethical matrix concept. We were introduced to the idea of using brainwave trackers to detect students' level of concentration, and we contemplated how this might impact students themselves, as well as teachers, parents, schools, researchers, ed tech developers, so on and so forth. I enjoyed taking a look at your ethical matrices. They were really quite interesting, and I thought you did a nice job of articulating the rationale behind the designs of those matrices. Now, Genta, as part of the synthesis assignment, analyzed all of your matrices. What he found was quite interesting. In terms of interest groups, 100% of the class listed students, and 83% of you listed parents. The next most popular interest groups were teachers, 67%, administrators, 58%, and community members, 42%. Somewhat surprisingly, only a few of you included the developers of the brainwave trackers as a possible interest group. Now, in terms of ethical principles, it seems many of you were influenced by MEPIM's original matrix. The top ethical principle was well-being, which everyone included. The second most popular principle was a tie between achievement and justice at 58%. These were followed by autonomy and privacy. Interesting. It would be fun to see how LTech students' ethical principles might change and or evolve from one decade to the next. Now, in his write-up, Genta noted that several of you reported the general benefits of building ethical matrices, such as reducing disruptive fixation and offering new perspectives and finding areas where one concept might defeat another or where a compromise should be sought. He concluded by arguing that building ethical matrices was a great exercise for considering the possible effects of a given technology or innovation on different interest groups and contrasting how their objectives can be similar or different based on ethical principles. This sentiment was echoed by Haley in her synthesis write-up. Haley noted that a majority of you in the class were able to acknowledge that you did in fact have your own biases going into the creation of this matrix. However, you agreed that the matrix does allow one to see aspects through other perspectives, as opposed through only, say, the teacher lens. And Haley concluded by pointing out that the emotional tethering can keep us from solving the problems we need to solve. So well done, Genta, and well done, Haley. Thank you to you both. And just as a reminder to all of you, you can always check out the full synthesis write-ups for each critical reflection assignment by visiting the discussion thread synthesis link on the overview module on Canvas. Just for fun, I decided to ask everyone's new best friend, ChatGPT, if it is ethical to ask elementary students to wear brainwave trackers in the classroom. Here's how it responded. First, it pointed out that as an AI language model, it does not have personal beliefs or opinions. However, I can provide information and insights that may help you arrive at an informed decision. And so what did it say? It said there are five points to consider. 
we need to consider informed consent, privacy and data security, stigmatization and labeling, discrimination, and pedagogical value. So I thought that was kind of interesting and wanted to share it with you. Anyways, enough about that. Let's move on. Now, I want to move forward to talk about our next theme. And as you know, we have five themes in LTech 676. We started with theme one, the nature of educational technology. Theme two was technology and equity in schools. Theme three was racial and ethnic divides, differences in needs. And today we're beginning our fourth theme, which is giving voice and disempowering structural inequalities. Now, when we're talking about structural inequalities, I hope your mind is drawing a dotted line to our illustrated analogy of inequity when it comes to education and opportunity in society. And so theme four is going to be talking about giving voice and disempowering those structural inequalities. Now to do that, we began reading the first chapter of Disruptive Fixation by Christo Sims. And Sims argues that we are accustomed to arguments that herald recent breakthroughs in information and communication technologies for their potential to reinvent outmoded educational systems, to develop areas of the world with high rates of poverty, or to knit together the planet in a harmonious way. In other words, Sims argues that we're used to the idea that some new technology is going to address societal ills. We are, for, for a lack of a better term, sold this idea over and over again, that technology is a way to address these problems. And on the very first page, Sims reveals his perspective on this, stating that what is puzzling is how so many of us hope and even demand that the next time will be different. He acknowledges that technology never has addressed all of these problems. And so he's puzzled by the continued hope and even demand that the next round of technologies is actually going to make a difference. Of course, this ties right into where we began the course with this idea that society has long-standing and stubborn problems or societal ills, such as poverty, homelessness, discrimination, low civil engagement. This brings us to an important concept that Christo Sims talks about in his book, which he labels perennial rejuvenation of optimism and idealism. Now, I want to connect this idea to Gartner's hype cycle. Gartner, of course, is the big technology consulting company, and it claims that the hype cycle is a graphical representation of the maturity and adoption of technologies and applications and how they are potentially relevant relevant to solving problems and exploiting new opportunities. Gartner claims that the hype cycle graphic provides a view of how a technology or application will evolve over time, providing some insight on how to leverage it within the context of an organization's or sector's specific goals. Now, importantly, the hype cycle, according to Gartner, has five phases. And they plot these phases, keeping in mind expectations and time. Now, the first phase is what they call the innovation trigger. And this happens when a potential technology breakthrough kicks things off. This might be an early proof of concept and stories and media begin to trigger significant publicity about this particular breakthrough. At this point, there's no usable products or commercial viability. It, everything at this point is really just prototypes and, and its viability is largely unproven. From there, we have the second phase, which is the peak of inflated expectations. And at this point, early publicity produces a number of success stories. Some companies may take action to take advantage of the new breakthrough or the new technology, and others may not. After the peak of inflated expectations, we have the trough of disillusionment. Is Notice how expectations have reached a bottom. At this point, interest wanes as experiments and implementations fail to deliver on their promises. Producers of the technology shake out or fail. Investments continue only if the surviving providers of the technology improve their products to the satisfaction of the early adopters. 
So you can see here, it's kind of the, the opposite of the peak of inflated expectations. Everyone becomes disillusioned. This technology is not what we thought it was going to be. From there, we have the slope of enlightenment. This is the fourth phase. And what happens in this phase is that more instances of how the technology can benefit a sector start to become obvious and more widely understood. Second and third generation products appear from technology providers and more conservative companies begin to express interest in adopting the technology. From here, we reach the plateau of productivity, the fifth and final phase of Gartner's hype cycle. In the plateau of productivity, mainstream adoption starts to take off. Criteria for assessing the viability are more clearly defined, and the technology's broad market applicability and relevance are clearly paying off. So at this point, pretty much everyone is on board and people know how to use the technology, how to implement it, and it's solving concrete problems. So there you have the five phases of Gartner's hype cycle. Now, I want to connect these five phases to Christo Sim's idea of, of the perennial rejuvenation of optimism and idealism. And so as educators, I want to ask all of you, where would you place the following educational technologies on the slope of the hype cycle? Where would you put learning management systems? Where would you put one-to-one -one laptop programs? Where would you put virtual and augmented reality? And finally, where would you put the brainwave trackers from Critical Reflection 6? Where do you think those fall on, on Gartner's hype cycle? Let's connect Gartner's hype cycle back to the headlines that we looked at earlier in the semester. Is it possible that the hype cycle helps explain the spectrum of perspectives that we've seen in the popular press? On the one hand, on the left, we might say we're seeing the peak of inflated expectations about the role of technology in education, whereas on the right, we're seeing the trough of disillusionment when it comes to specific technologies in schools. Now, another important point that makes is that education is remarkable for the extent to which it is repeatedly targeted for disruption, especially in the United States. He makes the point that even with all of these societal ills, education is the sector that is repeatedly targeted for disruption by technology. And he points out on page five, public debates about education reform tend to focus narrowly on how to fix education educational structures rather than on asking whether these are the right structures to be fixing in order to bring about hoped for social outcomes. In other words, yes, there may be educational structures that need to be fixed, but are those the structures that are ultimately going to help us deal with poverty, unemployment, low civil engagement, so on and so forth. Sims wants us to explore these questions, and he does this by presenting a case study of what he calls the downtown school. Now, we'll talk more about the downtown school next week, but for now, let's set it up like this. The downtown school was put together to address an important problem, according to the techno-philanthropists that funded the downtown school. And the problem, as these philanthropists saw it, was we're living in a radically new, interconnected, technologically saturated, and unequal era. The problem is our inherited educational institutions are woefully out of date. So what was the solution? Well, the solution proposed by the techno-philanthropists was to put together a new school for digital kids where the entire pedagogy would be organized like a game and students would learn to be creative makers, remixers, and hackers of technology and culture. So that's kind of the premise of the downtown school. And Christo Sims is going to walk us through what actually happened at the downtown school in terms of what it hoped to achieve and what it actually ended up achieving, which is what we'll look at next week. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.